All right, guys, let's keep the uplifting going. We've been dealing with a lot of junk the last couple of days. Look, it happened. It's done. Separate yourself from it. Let's get back into the scriptures and the important part, which is our walk with the Lord. We want to stay with our faith and trust in him, because when we do that, nothing else bothers us and nothing else matters. I know it's hard. I've been there, struggled with it. I've lost money. Uh, you know, disappointments abound. Last night, all the stuff that I was finding, you know, I was pretty disappointed because all these people, thousands and thousands of people are being misled and have been ripped off. God's people. Um, but you know what? We covered it. We brought it up to light. We've exposed it. It's going to be dealt with. And we're going to give it all to God and let him deal with it because he's our father. We trust him. And we know he said, I'll deal with it. I got it. Don't worry about it. And what's done is done. Now we're going to move on and we want to get into good, uplifting scripture. We want to get into things that pertain to our real life today so we have a closer walk with him and a better relationship with him. And our faith gets built up and stronger because, guys, we're seeing the end of days. All the signs that Jesus said were going to happen. He goes, when you see all these things, look up. Your deliverance draws nigh unto you. We see every one of those things and more. And they've been going on for a while now. So what does that tell us? Now, whether it's going to happen in a month, whether it's going to happen in a week, a year, two years, five years, we don't know. We don't exactly know. The Bible very clearly, and don't let anybody mislead you like somebody just did. The Bible very clearly says, no one knows the day or the hour, save the Father himself. Not the angels and not Jesus. And when he ascended, he still didn't know. And there's a reason, a very specific reason. I've covered this in previous videos over the last couple of months. If we knew the day it was going to happen, because this happens, bless you, this happens every time somebody puts a date up. If we knew the exact day and time it was going to happen, people would go out and would live like hell. And then a week prior, the churches would be packed. Three services a day, standing room only. People trying to get right with God, thinking that's going to get them right with God. They're going to run up dead. They're going to go out and mess around with women. They're going to you know, men, drink and party, everything, get it all in, and then go, okay, now I'm going to get right with God. And that's not what he wants. Because even God's people, even some of the elect would do that very same thing, thinking they're okay. No, it's not what, we, not what he wants and not what we want. So nobody knows that day. Now we go in the Bible, because a lot of people apply that scripture to the second coming. We go to the Bible and we read, and we read all the details about the second coming excuse me, in the tribulation, a very specific day count is given for the entire seven years, plus 45 days after that. And key events happen to mark different points in that timeline. So we know exactly when Jesus is going to come to the day. We can count. Once we see this event, we count this many days. Bam, there it is. So we know when this stuff's going to happen. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen, and we can't possibly find it. A lot of people think they can. They are killing themselves, putting all their faith in their gematria and their conversions and their other books and all this kind of stuff. And what's in, what I've started to notice, that a great deception, the great deception is coming up, that the Bible is incorrectly translated or it's false or that the writings of Paul are false. Look, God and Jesus both said, the world and the heavens will pass away, but my word shall stand. If he is omnipotent and nothing has been created that wasn't created by him. Don't we, is it reasonable to think that he can preserve his Bible for this long? Absolutely. So the first step in you putting all your faith on him is you have to believe the Bible is true. Every word of it. Because if you even think one word is, is wrong, then you've already, don't, you don't have your faith built on a cornerstone. You don't have it built on a good foundation. You have to have a foundation. What's the foundation? What's the cornerstone? Jesus Christ. What's the other name for Jesus Christ? The Word. So we rely on this to give us the truth to get us in the right place. And when we read it and as we study it and as he opens it up to us, we start to realize exactly how all this is going to play out and what our part is in it. And we start walking more closely with him. And we don't worry about the things of the world. But when you see people going on the other side, they are so caught up with so many things involving the world and they're full of hatred and anger. Every time somebody comes up and starts giving me grief about Paul's writings, they are just full of vitriol and it's just pouring out of their comments. And it's okay. Well, obviously you're not walking with the Lord because you don't have love in your heart. 
You're not coming from a place of understanding and patience, trying to warn people. Um, and anybody who's on that other side, oh, no, you can't believe the Bible. None of that's true. This is all this, that, and the other. All these people going on about, well, John Darby invented the rapture. No, John Darby didn't. There have been hundreds of people from the time right after Jesus died all the way up to now that have preached a pre-tribulation rapture. Ephraim the Syrian is one of the more notable ones. And I've over and over again, I've tried to show up and look, go look up Ephraim the Syrian, go read about him. There's all kinds of articles online. You can go read about that situation. And people come up, always look for any excuse to say, no, no, it wasn't him. No, it was. Right now, we have over 26,000 writings. All have been verified, all have been dated, and all have been translated. And it all points to a pre-tribulation rapture. This has been the ongoing theme. Paul taught a pre-trib rapture. John taught a pre-trib rapture. All the guys taught a pre-trib rapture. Because they were with Jesus, they walked with him. They knew. He told them, and they knew. So, you either believe it or you don't. That doesn't matter. It's not a salvation issue. What's important is that we understand how our walk is. But we see all the issues that are going on. We see all the struggles that are going on. We need to avoid these things. Because that's not to following God. What's following, what following God is, is abiding in love. And abiding in faith. And putting all of it on Jesus. And abiding in hope. Hope of a deliverance from the tribulation. Hope of a pre-tribulation rapture. Hope that our Lord is going to come for us. And we walk in that faith. And he likes that because that shows we're trusting in him. Lord, I'm looking at you. Even if I have to go through the tribulation, I'm still watching for you. I'm ready for whatever comes. So abiding in love, and I've covered this in actually quite a few videos. Love is one of the most important ingredients in a Christian walk. And it's the glue that binds all of us together, especially in, in the body. Because when we bound, we're bound together in love, when one suffers, all suffer. When one rejoices, all rejoice. But we all become a part of the same symbiotic spiritual relationship. And we, lear we learn discernment. We get gifts. We Other people that have been given something different up uplift and edify the rest of the brethren with that gift or whatever different they've been given. A lot of people have a hard time understanding the, the scriptures. There are people who have been given more understanding, more discernment, um, the ability to interpret much better and a lot of us are watchmen. I'm not saying I'm better. I'm just saying I have. I know I have discernment. I'm not better, but we all link together to share these things. This is what I was pushed to do. There's many other watchmen do the same thing. And we go and we listen to them and we, we listen to the scriptures. But we don't believe it until we verify it. Take what I say, go to the Bible. I'm going to give you scripture references. Write them down. Go look at it yourself. And I use a Google trick for all the new people. And it is Bible. I type in Bible verses about and then put whatever I'm looking for in there. And Bible study tools, open Bible, knowing the Bible. Uh, there's all kinds of different ones that will give you stacks of scriptures that pertain to that. You go in there, you read it, oh, cool. See them all there, oh, wow, that, a lot of that stuff applies to it. And in many cases, I can find about 100 of them that apply to any one subject. Then you go open your Bible and take each one and read each chapter. And it really broadens your understanding and broadens your view of how all this stuff unfolds and what the message is he's trying to get across. So in love, Bible verses about love, there's a hundred Bible verses on this page I'm looking at. And we're going to start, and I'm not going to read all of them, don't worry. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. So right off the bat, you can tell whether somebody's coming from a place of love. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. If you don't have love, you've got nothing. And uh, forget who was talking about it. Maybe Peter, maybe James was talking about, you know, if I have this but have no love, what good does it do me? If I have this but have no love, what good does it do me? If I die for my brethren but have no love, what good does it do me? It doesn't because if you're doing it, it all comes about where you're coming from. It's all, I did a video about the heart. All, all of this is in the heart. What is your driving force? What is your, what is pushing you to do the things that you're doing? Giving money. A lot of people write a check every week or every month, throw it, throw it in the offering plate. 
that's my duty as a Christian. Well, now you've just ruined the gift that you think you're giving to God because now you think it's your duty to do this. Now go back and look at it again. I love him. I have had a great month. I'm writing a check for this and I'm going to donate it. Father, I'll anoint this money to bless you. Now you've got a place of love where it's coming through. But I see people all the time throwing money out there thinking, oh, I'm good. I gave 10% of my money. This is all God's. 10% of your time, 2.4 hours a day. Are you spending that much time praying or talking to God or reading the Bible? 2.4% of all your stuff that you have, not just your money. 2.4% of your car, 2.4% of your home. It applies to everything. Tithing, you can tithe anything. So when you understand it from that point of view, you realize, oh, well, throwing money in there isn't, because it's all his, but throwing money in there really, really isn't near as important as if I spend more time helping people. Because my time is very valuable and very important. Or if I spend my energy doing something for somebody or spend time reading the Bible or in the Lord. I spend more time doing this than I probably, well, I spend more time doing this than most other things that I do. Uh, and it's been like that for six months now. Um, and this is part of my worship, my tithing to the Lord. I also spend a lot of time in scripture. I spend a lot of time doing research, a lot of time talking to him. It's all part of that tithing thing. And I give when I can. Um, I don't focus so much on giving 10%. I give when I can. And what happens is it usually ends up being more than 10% on the other end of it. God knows he's watching all of it. But we don't focus too much on, I have to do this. Wait a minute. Where is your heart coming from? Is, it, is your desire from a place of love or because you think you have to? I must pray 11 times a day. There's a lot of people that believe that. If I don't pray 11 times a day, God's not happy with me. But now it's not coming from a place of love. You're not talking to him because you love him. You're talking to him because you feel like it's your duty to pray 11 times a day. He's not going to hear your prayers because your prayers don't mean anything. There's nothing attached to them. Guys, I've gotten into prayer where so much emotion came out because I connected with him on a spiritual level, the relationship. There was one night I was answering somebody's question, one of the subscribers' questions, and he was standing right here. I could feel it. I had goosebumps. Everything, the whole atmosphere changed. And he was talking to that person through me in the scriptures. Think about your walk. Instead of paying attention to what other people are doing out there, don't worry about them. God will deal with them. Look inward because you're the only one you can affect. You're the only one you can change. Look in here and let's see what's going on in here. And you start to see, uh, you know, what? I need to fix some things. But that's why we go over scripture, guys, because it tells us all this. And the scripture leads us down this path to a much closer, much more intimate relationship with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Let all that you do be done in love. 1 John 4, 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. How much love did a creator who created everything, seen and unseen, how much love does he have that he came and looked at that little tiny blue marble in the middle of that vastness of dark, and it actually t is taking the time to deal with us on a very personal level, to redeem us and to save us, to go be with him in the, in the amazing heaven that he has. That's a lot of love. And then to, Jesus was had held a very high glorious position in heaven. And he laid it down and came here to live and die in the flesh, to be tortured, to be beaten so badly nobody recognized him for us. It's a lot of love. John 3.16, my favorite verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 13, 34, 35, a new commandment I give you and you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love is a key ingredient in all of this that we do. Of any and all of the things that we achieve as a Christian, love in all things is the most desirable. Out of love comes faith. Out of love comes hope. So we develop the love first. We re recognize that... Come on in, Daddy. When we recognize that... You know, our... Anything that we do, if it doesn't come from a place of love, it doesn't have any good effect. You hate on another Christian, you 
throw a bunch of vitriol, you look down on them because they don't see the scriptures the way you do, or they don't believe a doctrine that you've come up with or you that you've believed from someone else. There's no love there. Now you have to come from a place of love. Hey, let's talk about this because I see something different. Let's discuss it. And what happens is if you do it from a place of love, both of you gel and you both come to an even greater understanding. Colossians 3.14, and above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. I just said that. It's the glue. It binds everything together in perfect harmony. So if you don't have love in this situation, if there's no love tied to your faith, what good is your faith? If there's no love tied to your walk with the Lord, what good is your walk with the Lord? So, it's, so don't look at other people. Don't worry about what they're doing. Focus on this. Because if it's not here, it's not going to do you any good. None of it's going to do you any good. You wonder why your lives are still all messed up and why you still struggle. Give it all to him. Faith, trust, everything. And do it with love. I'm going to stop there. So go and do that Google search. Bible verses about love. Read all of them. There's a hundred of them in that list. And then go to the Bible and read them in context. And it so much opens your view of this and your understanding of this. But guys, I'm telling you, that's the one key ingredient in all this. Is if you can't put love onto, onto something and apply it, it's not is of no effect. None of your gifts, none of your prayers, nothing will make God happy unless love is tied to it. I love you guys. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I will see you all in the next video.